Dr. Hassan. Today, I thought we would talk about the current challenges of maintaining a safe and stable blood supply. There's my disclosure statement. And I thought I would just um, put the objectives up to give a roadmap of where the talk is going to go today. So we're going to start by talking about the commoditization of blood. Um, since I'm an immunohematologist, I just had to throw in um, something that puts pressure on the O supply, uh, new medications that are um, uh, making the requirements for the units we need to find more specific and harder to find. State a couple ways how the pandemic has resulted in uh, another challenge to keeping the blood supply stable. And then the new debate that's kind of old but new again is whether we should be paying donors uh, as a way to maintain stability of the supply. Okay. So commodity, the definition, a basic good used in commerce that is interchangeable with other goods of the same type. These next few quotes are from a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017 by Drs. Klein and Epstein, two very well-known blood bankers. Although blood is collected from non-remunerated volunteers by nonprofit organizations, the medical system treats blood as a commodity, complete with blood exchanges and a spot market for urgent purchases. The competitive market for blood used to be robust. However, a decade of changes in red cell use and healthcare delivery has altered market conditions significantly to place the sustainability of the current system at risk. So in 2016, a poll by, um, of members of America's Blood Centers and a look at the revenue losses in the American Red Cross um, system showed that 90% of our nation's blood supply was being provided at a cost that was less than it cost to produce the units. How did we get here? Well, one factor is advances in medical practice leading to less blood usage. So that's very good for the patient. I'm gonna say this started probably with the publication of transfusion requirements in critical care, the TRIC trial which started to show that a restrictive strategy for transfusion was not inferior to a liberal strategy for transfusion. And since the TRIC trial was published, we've had many more papers in different patient populations showing that a restrictive strategy is not inferior, and sometimes it may even be better for the patient population. So this is good, very good for medical practice, but blood centers, blood suppliers have a pretty limited portfolio. Their reason for existing is to provide blood for patients. And so as we start to see less blood usage, the revenue of the blood supplier goes down. As demand decreases, the cost to produce a unit rises. And then over the last 20 years, we've certainly seen things like the implementation of LUCA reduction. So I'm just showing a leukocyte filter. Uh, it's not coming up on, on here, but it is on my slide, um, which adds cost to the unit when you want to get the white cells out of the unit by LUCA reduction. And then as new pathogens emerge, the FDA requires that we do additional testing on every unit of blood. It's two examples were West Nile virus and Chagas disease. And so these add to the cost of the units. And so this just uh, shows from the National Blood Collection and Utilization Survey, this decline in components transfused and with it, 
components collected. We try very hard to be stewards of the supply, and so if we can see the demand is going down, we may not collect as many units so that we don't get into a wasted situation. At the same time, blood suppliers chose to give in to reducing the price for blood as a tool for expanding their footprint. So in, in a different system uh, with a commodity, if you reduce your price, the way you make up for that is to sell more. But that's not how healthcare works. The orthopedic surgeon who wants to replace a patient's hip knows they want two units of blood. If you reduce the price on those units, it's not like the surgeon's going to order more blood for the case. So it's what economists refer to as an inelastic demand curve in this situation. Hospital systems were struggling, and so they started to consolidate. And this gives those systems increased bargaining power. So if, if you have a larger size and more volume, we start to see expectations that they get better pricing for the product. Well, the competition between the blood suppliers led to the offer to sell blood for less than the production cost in order to gain the customer. But once you start down this path, when you then, two years later, tell the customer, well, actually, we're, we're actually losing money on what it costs to produce units, the customer is going to be resistant. So you can see the writing on the wall. This is a dangerous path to go down, and it leads to instability of the supply. Add to this the fact that there's no mechanism in place for the reimbursement of the true cost to produce a unit, and now we've very much imperiled the supply. So this system of DRGs for inpatients, 80% of transfusions and the blood supplied are not reimbursed at the true cost. Okay, what does this mean for the ability to recruit blood donors? Basically, if you have no margin as the blood supplier, you don't have enough money for innovation, for making things more convenient for donors, and for keeping up those efforts to remind people how important it is to donate blood. So now we impact our ability to recruit enough donors. Now, I think we all know, but if we don't, I'll say it, there is currently no replacement for human blood. Mother Nature has done a wonderful job figuring out how to make a red cell with hemoglobin encapsulated in a membrane, and it is very, very hard to reproduce the effect of a human red cell. So if blood centers go under financially, we'll need to develop another system. Someone else will need to take up the charge. So just to reflect for a, a moment um, on the purpose of blood products. Two weeks ago, one of our community hospitals saved the life of an obstetrical patient. It took a team of three surgeons very dedicated nurses, medical laboratory scientists at the coagulation bench, and one extremely experienced blood bank technologist to save the life of this patient. It also took four pools of cryoprecipitate, which is 20 blood donors, and let's see, 18 units of red cells and 18 units of plasma and three platelets. So a very, very large effort to save the patient. And the team could not have proceeded very far without blood. Every blood banker in this room can tell you of a success story, but it's required blood to make it happen. So I really think we've gone astray. I think we've done ourselves a disservice to treat blood as a commodity. And I think we need some different solutions going forward. I can't really give you the answers as to what those are today, but something needs to change. So this is where we were in 2018 as far as the challenge to the supply. And this challenge really has not gone away. But we had a distraction in the pandemic, 
And it did have some lasting effects that also challenged the stability of the supply. Appointment only is here to stay. So if you're a blood donor and a blood supplier does an emergency appeal for blood, the donors are used to getting online, trying to say, I'm going to get in line tomorrow at my local facility where they collect blood and I'm going to go donate because there's this emergent appeal. They would get online and say, wait a minute, for my closest location, I can't donate until five days from now. How much of an emergency is this? But it really is, and it really does impact the supply. Now I'm going to wager that with setting up appointment only, once the donor makes that appointment, it's actually probably more convenient for the donor. They're able to fill out the donor card the day of donation before they get there, and um, they have enough staff as they arrive to collect them in a very timely manner. So appointment only, here to stay, no more waiting in line in a crowded blood donation room um, that's, that's gone away. Collection on site of schools and hospitals, and I'm super excited to see the notifications about blood drives at UW this week, thank you, um, is slowly recovering. The Great Migration, I feel like we're moving beyond it, which is good, but summer of 2022 was really, really hard. People did not want to take phlebotomy jobs. We had blood donors willing to donate and no one to collect them. And this wasn't just Seattle, this was the entire nation. So the usual system we have of importing units from someone who's doing well with collections was not available. It's a very, very stressful time. I'm glad to see that we're recovering that and hiring more and more phlebotomists. Only with that hiring can we um, once again collect at, in hospitals and schools. But places like Microsoft still working remotely, and so the old ability to go on site to a big company and collect blood is still very much impaired. And then right in the middle of this pandemic, the FDA um, put out a guidance for industry, and guidances are required to be followed. So even though it says guidance, it's really a rule. Um, for the detection of more bacteria in platelets. What this meant for Seattle was we used to use whole blood derived platelets and this guidance really pushed the decision to go to an apheresis only supply. Now this is difficult because platelets only have at most a seven day shelf life. And an apheresis platelet takes an hour and a half to two hours of a donor's time for the collection. Not many of us have two hours to give an apheresis platelet. So we mitigate this by collecting donors with a really high platelet count. Um, we call what's called, you know, we're trying to collect three products in one donor or a triple. Uh, we refine our instruments to maximize the yield, things we should be doing already. And then there's definitely talk in the blood bank community about, well, FDA wants us to have three times 10 to the 11th platelets per unit. Maybe that's really not medically necessary. There are studies showing that a lower dose keeps the patient from bleeding. So um, FDA has not budged on that yet, but there's definitely talk as to whether lower dose would help us expand the supply. Um, this is just a graph um, of our platelet donors and their age. So you can see that the younger donors, 16 to 26, um, don't give nearly as many apheresis platelets as our older donors. Perhaps it's because of lack of time, but this, this is a place where we need to really be doing education and, and um, letting donors know of the importance of platelet donation and establishing good habits with our donors. And the need for platelet transfusion is very likely going to increase as the population ages. So the stress on the platelet supply is always quite high given its short shelf life. There's also more pressure than ever on group O's. Um, several years ago, the ABB mandated 
what's what I call the ABO2 sample rule. So if you've never seen a patient before, we have to have two samples to test their ABO type. And if you don't get the second sample in a timely manner and they need transfused, we need to issue group O cells. So this puts pressure on the O supply. We also are back to the habit of using whole blood. This is one of these things that is not new. It's actually quite old. We used to use whole blood years ago. It is indeed saving the lives of trauma patients in the pre-hospital setting, especially those that have, for example, a thoracic injury that you can't compress. Whole blood very, very well is saving lives to get them blood in the ambulance. But we need to realize right now, big picture wise, the shelf life is 21 days. And so compared to a packed red cell, which is 42. And so if we shift enough of the supply over to 21 days, it's actually pretty hard to have enough supply. So we just wanna keep that in mind. And then this need for extended matching for, with new agents for cancer therapy. So the example I'm using is anti-CD47. And we need to remember that CD47 is an antigen on a red cell. There's a couple different um, formulations of these agents. One is an IgG4 monoclonal antibody. We actually have a reagent in the red cell lab that allows us to skirt the effect of this antibody. But for the fusion protein, it binds to the red cell, the CD47 antigen, and we can't get it off. So normally in blood bank, you use reagent red cells to bind the anti-cal that the patient has made with the cal positive cell. We can no longer see that effect when a patient is on this drug. It looks like a warm autoantibody pattern and we can't skirt around it by using adsorptions and the usual things. And so what we're left with is performing red cell genomics to get the patient's full extended red cell phenotype. And because we don't know if they've made alloantibodies, we have to find a fully phenotypically matched cell. We usually use O cells for this so that we don't have to worry about ABO type as part of this very difficult match. So right now, ALX148 really challenging us. We had a patient up at Whidbey Island a month ago who needed three red cells, and we could not find the third cell because it needed to be fully antigen matched. So once again, just looking at our donor data and now extending out into 2021 with the effects of the pandemic, you can see that for the 19 and under age group, our inability to go into high schools, the quarantine really really impacting that age group, for example. We've had a 31% loss in donors less than 60, whereas our donors greater than 60 have stepped it up with a 52% gain, okay? But it's becoming really critical that we recruit the younger donors in the community. How do we maintain a stable donor base? Recruit new donors, relax the rules. We're gonna talk about that next. Physical expansion of the donor recruitment or collection area, but if you look big picture wise, you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. So if my blood center expands their territory, another blood center is losing territory, right? It's kind of a neutral gain that way or loss. And then we work really hard to retain and renew the commitment of our current donors. 62% of people are eligible to donate, only 3% actually do. And so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out why this is. Bloodworks did a market survey in 2020. It was a three month long survey of the donors and the non-donors in the area. And I won't go through this in detail, but for our current donors, number one reason is they want to help others and save lives. So altruism coming into play there, positive feeling of pride after giving blood, and they heard on the news that the donations were needed. So all of this bugging of blood donors we do is because they actually like to be reminded that it's needed. 
Dr. Savas looking at me. Yes. Okay. Public attitudes towards blood donation. 90% of adults have considered or actually donated blood. 50% would be willing if there was a mass shooting or a natural disaster. 34% see it as a civic responsibility. And 27 of us feel guilty about not doing it more often. Now, there are donors who don't donate as much as they can, and so Bloodworks polled them as well. And um, we start to see not eligible to donate. Either they've developed a medical condition on new medications, or they've traveled to a malarial endemic area, for example, and can't donate right now. Not enough time, or the donation process is too time consuming. So these apheresis platelets we need to collect are, are counter to this. They're not helping us. Um, at the time, people were scared to donate so they wouldn't come out during the pandemic. The donor location, too far away from my workplace or home. So convenience to the donor really matters as far as um, enticing people to donate. And then we asked people who never donated, um, why not? Fear is the number one reason, either of needles or pain, or that we'll find out they're actually not healthy, was what the number one listed. Um, some of them definitely didn't want to come out during the coronavirus pandemic. And not enough time, too time consuming. Okay. So, Safety versus supply, always a balance. And if you set the rules too rigorously around safety, you lose donors out of the supply. Well, one of the things the pandemic did, unbelievably, was to stimulate relaxation of some of the rules. So the day New York Blood Center, New York City, excuse me, ran out of ventilators was unprecedented. And the next day, the FDA put out a call for COVID-19 convalescent plasma. In order to expand the number of donors who could give this, they relaxed the rules on three infectious agents. I'm making a big deal out of this because the FDA up to this point almost never changes their rules <laughs> around the safety of the blood supply. For example, we've had great tests to detect HIV since 2000, and it took the FDA 15 years to change the deferral of men who have sex with other men from permanent to 12 months. Okay, so they're very, very slow to change anything around the safety. And now the pandemic hits. So first, uh, first agent was variant CJD and CJD rules. And I, I um, have basically put some of the studies uh, in the references because I'm going to go through this quickly. But they deleted the permanent deferrals for things like five or more years in Europe since 1980. So that's variant CJD. Same with the US military or civilian personnel in Europe between 80 and 96 history of bovine insulin injection, all variant CJD, and then risk factors for iatrogenic CJD, they deleted the permanent deferral. So um, just again, this is one of the studies um, done in the US, published in 2017, that helped push this. So as the FDA relaxed the rules, they were definitely looking at the available data. And basically, um, CJD is hard to study because it has a very long incubation period. So this is a look back study, 21 years of surveillance, 65 blood donors subsequently diagnosed with confirmed or probable sporadic CJD, 826 blood recipients traced yearly with the National Death Index to see if they died of CJD. After 3,934 person years of follow-up, there were no transfusion transmitted cases of CJD. So we've always had a guess that sporadic CJD not easily transmitted through blood, but this study really helps show that's very likely right. With the variant CJD, there is a bit more concern that it is transmissible through blood 
But in 2007, the United Kingdom started Luca reducing all of their cellular products, and that seemed to have really helped fix this issue. Um, there have never been cases of variant CJD, or I should say mad cow disease, in the cow populations of the U.S. And we think that's because of the ban on beef and beef products that just happened to be in place um, as variant CJD showed up in the United Kingdom. Um, there were four cases of variant CJD in people in the U.S., but they were all people who had probably gotten it in the United Kingdom. So because of similar data that it looks like there hasn't been a reported case of transfusion transmissible variant CJD since 2007, this is the other reason FDA relaxed the rules. Now, it's all I can do to keep up with the FDA these days. So in January, based on further data, um, they deleted the permanent deferral for three or more months in the United Kingdom from 80 to 96. So I can't tell you how many more donors we're going to get from the deletion of these rules, but we will get some more for sure. Malaria, kind of a similar story, I think you all know, it's not endemic to the US, but they did study um, these 11 cases between 2000 and 2017. They looked at the data, asymptomatic infected donors who were former residents of endemic countries who, ha who had malaria already, none were from a traveler from a non-endemic country. These rules I find really difficult to read this guidance, but to try to keep it brief, if you're, for example, from the US and you travel to a place that has malaria, whether you take the prophylaxis or not, it's gonna be a three month deferral when you um, come back from that area. If you, looking at the other blue arrow, if you actually were from an endemic area, as long as you have spent three or more years away from that area with no signs of malaria, it's a three-month deferral compared to the year. So they relax those rules a bit. And then they relax the rules related to HIV and hepatitis. So again, our testing, very sensitive since 2000. And the FDA looked at data from places like Canada who moved to a three-month deferral for men having sex with other men, for example, and did not see an increase in transfusion transmission rates. And so in 2020, with the pandemic, the FDA changed the rules, um, as you can see. So it used to be a 12-month deferral. If you got a tattoo in a non-licensed parlor, they moved it to a three-month deferral, for example. Now, just in January, again, late breaking news, the FDA announced further relaxation of this criteria. So they've added, if a donor um, has been on HIV oral protection therapy, as long as they have not been on that therapy in the last three months, they're eligible to donate. And then gay or bisexual men in a monogamous relationship for the last three months will be eligible to donate. What our donors are going to see as far as the change to the donation card, the questionnaire is going to focus less on sexual orientation and more on an individual's risk factor. So all donors will be asked if they've had new partners in the last three months, and if so, they'll be asked a question about anal sex. And so people are actively trying to figure out how that uniform donor history questionnaire needs to read. So this is going to take a long time to implement because we're waiting to get approval of the new questions on the donor card. Um, it's going to be months before you see this relaxation roll out, but it's coming. Right? Okay, as I indicated at the beginning, everything is old, old is new again. There is a debate on whether paid donation can be done safely and without what's called crowding out uh, volunteers who are doing this for altruistic reasons. Why so much fear? It's interesting to read the history on this, and I imagine Dr. Hess can elaborate if needed. But in 1971, 70% of blood facilities were not regulated by either federal or state governments. So no uniform regulation. 
And we started to see philosophical disagreements about individual responsibilities, such as replacement fees and credit programs versus community responsibility for the blood supply. And finally, the public confidence in the nation's blood supply had deteriorated and the fear of contracting hepatitis was a primary concern. We did not have infectious disease testing for hepatitis to screen the blood supply at this point. Okay. In the early 1950s, editorials were published indicating that professional blood donors who sold their blood to large city blood banks were malnourished, homeless individuals, and that many were drug addicts and likely to carry hepatitis. That doesn't give you a lot of confidence. And then Dr. Allen is a surgeon who was at U Chicago for many years and then ended up leading Stanford's Department of Surgery. And he was very vocal on this issue and did several of the studies to follow hepatitis from transfusions. In 1959, he published a 10-year review of post-transfusion hepatitis at Chicago. And he stated there's two types of professional donors, with the majority being prisoners. The rates of post-transfusion hepatitis were seven to 10 times higher in recipients of professional donor blood compared to volunteer blood. Similar study, this was more of a prospective trial in 1970 in JAMA, were still showing that hepatitis um, from commercial blood much more prevalent than from volunteer blood. And so Dr. Allen wrote this editorial and basically nailed it. It's like, unless a strong federally licensed blood program is devised to provide quality blood, the risk of contracting hepatitis very likely to increase. And until we have a reliable test about the only screening device we have is whether the donor has been paid or not, okay? So 1972, the FDA did oversee, start to oversee all of the blood establishments in the country. They created regulations defining good manufacturing practices for blood and plasma, um, licensures required, and they instituted that every blood product, every donation, had to be tested for hepatitis B. So for us laboratory geeks in the audience, this was a tremendous development to the safety of the blood supply. The development of a test for hepatitis B really, really had an impact in reducing the infections through blood. Now, we knew that even with this wonderful test for hepatitis B, 10% of recipients still were contracting non-A, non-B hepatitis. It took until 1990 to develop a test for hepatitis C, but once that took place, look at this, look at this curve, it's way down, way down, okay? So um, I, I just remember, I, I, I'm old, and I remember that before they could even culture hepatitis C, they used early molecular biology techniques to create a CDA, cDNA library and screen it with a plasma from an infected patient to come up with the development of uh, what was called the REBA test for hepatitis C. A couple of years later, they did culture hepatitis C, but um, for those of you interested in this kind of history, it's just I find it quite fascinating and was very impressed at the time as to how they came up with hepatitis C tests. So our current strategy for layers of safety with blood donation, we have the uniform donor history questionnaire. Wherever someone donates in our country, they have to answer the same questions that are designed to get at donation risk. What are your practices high risk that you could transmit an infectious agent through the blood supply? We always do a limited physical exam that includes taking the donor's temperature to try to screen out anyone who could be actively infected, even with bacteria, for example. Always sterilize the phlebotomy site. The FDA will watch the phlebotomist as they sterilize with the iodine or whichever agent we're using. Wait 30 seconds 
before you put that needle in. That is a requirement that the inspector will watch. And then we have our transfusion transmissible disease testing as our layers of safety. Our testing is really, really good. It's not perfect. There's always a window period for HIV. The time between infection and detection is nine days. For HGV, it's seven days. And for hepatitis B, it's more like 18 days. So the risk of receiving a, a unit of blood and contracting HIV, one in 1.5 million. For hepatitis C, it's one in 1.1 million. You can see the numbers. So good, so low, so safe, that the FDA is focused on bacteria in platelets rather than viral infections. So I just wanted um, this audience to understand, because um, I find it confusing, when do we need to label a unit as from a paid donor? The absolute vast majority of the supply for the community is volunteer donor. And if you were to look at the units on the shelf in the transfusion service, they all have the volunteer label. Well, the FDA, um, says when a donor receives any amount of money for the donation or incentives that are readily convertible to cash, we must label the unit as paid. So they give some examples in their document. A raffle of a car would not constitute a paid donation. We can label that unit as volunteer from that donor. However, if we gave our donor something like Kraken tickets that could have a market where they could um, give those tickets to someone for money, we would need to label the unit given as paid. A gift card in a large amount that's non-transferable, bears the donor's name and redeemable for cash, allows us to label the unit as volunteer. It doesn't matter how big the incentive is. So I just want you guys to see um, the definitions we're using as we label units paid versus volunteer. Here's my summary. It's definitely my opinion. Donor testing assays result in a very safe supply. Paying donors can most likely be done in a way that mitigates the perceived additional risk of becoming a professional paid donor. So for example, we can have a person come in, do all of their infectious disease screening, wait however many weeks or months we want before they come in to donate their product, redo that infectious disease screening. At that point, if they had contracted HIV, we would know that and be able to discard the unit, not accept the donor. Really, anything, any payment, incentive, other, that leads a donor to lie on the questionnaire increases the risk to the community blood supply. So whether it's money, whether it's a huge trip to Hawaii, if we um, have donors who um, lie, we're going to increase the risk. Okay? So there is pathogen reduction technology in case some new threat arises. If we really had some emerging pathogen um, that we were very worried was in the supply and we really didn't have a test for yet, we have a way to treat platelets with this technology and plasma. It is not yet FDA approved for red cells. So um, I don't necessarily mean to make the con list longer than the pro list. Um, pathogen reduction definitely eliminates most viruses and bacteria. It does not eliminate prions. We know that. Um, one advantage is all of this work we do to culture apheresis platelets um, per the FDA regs would go away. You can skip doing the cultures. And then it turns out that the inactivation of T lymphocytes that happens with the PRT process is good enough to prevent transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. So if this gets approved for red cells, we could actually get rid of our irradiators. Uh, we wouldn't need to do that if everything underwent the PRT treatment. Okay. So what is the path forward? I really think it looks like continued focus on decreasing the pressure on the platelet and the group O supply. Um, there is a lot of talk about, why did we move to all apheresis anyway? Maybe we should return to whole blood platelets, 
but let's do it the way Europe does it. Let's produce them by what's called the Buffy Coat Method. We would need FDA approval to proceed with this, but there's definitely chatter among the blood bank community about, well, maybe to extend our platelet supply, we need to find a way to use our whole blood platelets better. Definitely studies for longer shelf life for platelets. Some of this is around cold stored platelets. Cold stored platelets are very good for trauma patients. They will um, act very quickly to help with hemostasis in the moment. What they're not so good for is prophylactic transfusion in cancer patients because they don't remain in circulation very long at all. But we're playing with whether we can store cold stored platelets for 14 days, right? So anything that's going to allow us to keep a platelet happy for longer and that the FDA approves is going to help extend the supply. There's a little bit of data out there that patients on these newer agents like ALX147 actually don't make new alloantibodies. So I'm interested to see where that goes. If that really were the case, we could have the clinician check their antibody screen before they start the therapy, know that we need to match for those alloantibodies, and with the assurance that they're not going to make new ones, maybe we don't need to provide phenotypically matched units. So I'm interested to see where that goes. Convenience to the donor, we got to just keep working on this. We need to work hard to prevent reactions like vasovagal reactions because they can prevent donors from coming back. We want to develop new technologies so they stop poking my finger. I hate that part, right? Um, my understanding is we're not quite there yet to be able to just scan and see a person's hemoglobin level well enough, but hopefully it's coming. And then um, really every other aspect that could increase convenience to our donors is what we need to be working on. I really do think we need to return to this idea. Some type of significant public or private intervention will probably be required to maintain adequate blood system infrastructure. So for example, Canada, the government has the Canadian Blood Services. This New England Journal paper, the authors did not think such a model would work in the US, but they do agree that some intervention is probably going to be required. Um, I did just want to give a shout out, thank the donor program. Um, we do have this at Bloodworks and a lot of places in the country um, use this. This is where the recipient of the product has the opportunity to thank the person who donated the unit. I had trouble finding data on how effective this is but my sense is it's one of the more effective strategies to keep our donors coming back. Um, so I personally can't wait to receive one of these green hearts. Um, and I, I think it's one of the better mechanisms for retention of, of donors. And with that, um, I will stop and take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, Dr. Pagano. Uh, thank you, Sarisa. That was a great, great presentation and also summary of the challenges that the blood centers face across the country. I have two questions, actually. The number one is uh, whether you can give an example of a recruiting strategy that has worked for blood works. Uh, as an example, there are uh, other uh, blood centers in the country that have developed some recruiting strategies, for instance, for whole blood. Uh, one of them that comes into mind is Brothers in Arms that target a specific area of the community to, to donate whole blood for, tra for the trauma setting and has been shown to be successful. So, uh, and then the other question is whether you have also developed any strategy to uh, increase diversity uh, in the blood donors given that we know that many minority groups do not trust the system enough to go and donate. Right, um, so I'm supposed to repeat the, the question, so I'll try to summarize. The first question is, do we have um, specific strategies that we know have been successful? Um, so I may not be the best equipped to answer that. I can tell you, um, 
We are actively developing a program. It's along the lines of music in our blood. So that actually has been a very um, popular um, campaign to tie music and musical artists and get them to advocate um, how important it is to donate blood. And we're rolling it out to high schools. So um, there's kind of joint grants with Macklemore and other artists to bring music to the schools and at the same time stress the importance of donation. I guess I'm waiting to see the effects of that, but I know the initial um, response has been super, uh, super positive to that recruitment effort. Your second question was, are we making efforts to increase diversity in the supply? Um, I know we, well, I can tell you, um, a lot of conversation uh, about um, um, donors who are from South America, for example, trying to figure out how to recruit um, Spanish-speaking donors. And of course, it's a little bit complicated all the way through from, well, they need to answer the Uniform Donor History Questionnaire. We probably need people who can interpret for them to make sure we're understanding when they answer the high-risk questions. Are they truly understanding the question and are we able, if they get confused, to lay out the question well enough to make sure we're, not, we're still protecting the community supply? And then there's our docs on call. None of us speak Spanish. And so if the donor has a reaction, we're going to be calling you so that you can help us interpret the reaction. Um, lots of, of um, effort in that regard to think carefully. We want to do it. It's going to take time. It's small. It's, um, excuse me, it's a, big, it's a big project. So I feel like uh, I don't know who else is on the line today. If Dr. Alcorn were on the line, she probably could give a much better example. But we absolutely are very tuned in to increasing the diversity um, of, of this supply, particularly knowing that with our sickle cell patients, for example, you're much more likely to have a molecular match um, from a, a patient who's also of African descent, for example. Dr. Sang. Hi, um, thanks for that talk. Given that there's paid plasma donors, what kinds of different safeguards do they have there that, um, that are effective for those paid plasma donors? So the paid plasma currently does not go to the community supply. It's, it's used to make IVIG, for example. Um, I don't know that there are more safeguards. I've definitely seen in the literature that um, you know it's it's good that we have the uniform donor history questionnaire because people try to donate more than two times a week, which is against the FDA rules. And so um, I do see if you're starting to pay donors, we just need to follow our rules, right? Both for the protection of the donor. As, as well as, well, really, for the protection of the donor, it's probably not good to donate more than twice a week, right? So um, can I think of extra safeguards that they put in place? To my knowledge, go ahead, John. Yeah, well, it's all uh, nano-filtered. And much of it is solvent. And cone fractionation. Oh, there you go. Right. So it's not so much how they're... Um, doing anything different with the donor, but the cone fractionation and the treatment of the pooled plasma beats up on coagulation proteins, right? So it, it adds um, a measure to remove infectious agents, for, for sure. Um, but to think we can do that with the community supply probably won't work because we need the coagulation proteins. Do you want to say more, John? OK. Yes, Brian. We have a few questions online. So Levi Jones says, is it feasible to use PRT on pooled whole blood platelets, a la Sorelian treated by pool, to help the platelet supply? I don't think it's been approved for whole blood platelets. It's only apheresis. Another question from William Phipps. What percentage of apheresis platelets expire before use? 
So the question is what percent of apheresis platelets expire before use? Um, that's going to vary greatly, so it's a little bit hard um, to, to answer. And um, we take into account our ABO types. So for example, AB platelets are going to be universally compatible, so very, very few of those we would expect to waste. Um, but it's really about you know this, this game we play of predicting demand and supply, right? So if we were very, very highly tuned and we could predict the patients coming in that week, then um, we wouldn't waste any platelets at all. We'd probably, if we had trauma, we'd even ask for more platelets. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not answering that question well, but every place that has a transfusion service tries very hard to see what the average usage is on any given day, what surgeries are occurring, how many platelets are usually needed for those surgeries. They know how many hemonc patients um, they generally see during clinic on each day, and they're gonna tailor the ordering of the platelets to that. So, so outpatient transfusion kind of stuff, you shouldn't see any wastage at all. The traumas are much harder to predict, and you'd get more wastage there. One more question online. So Max Lazan asks, with the changing donor qualifications, are there any plans to engage with the general public to inform them of the changes? So with the change in donor qualifications, are there plans to engage with the public? They're ongoing, ongoing plans. Um, so this most recent um, change in the guidance uh, about individual risk, definitely two weeks ago there uh, were news broadcasts about it. There's articles in the Seattle Times about it. Um, both helping people know that the relaxation of the rules is occurring, as well as it's going to take time to implement. It's just not something you can do overnight. So, Dr. Pagana? All right. <laughs> Since you're there, I'm going to ask you all the questions, right? <laughs> so, uh, there has been, over the last several months, I would say, there has been this request from, from some patients to receive blood from, from donors who have not been vaccinated. And now, this is not something new, but that's something that is ongoing. But what has been new to me is that now there are some donors that haven't been vaccinated and want their blood to be labeled as non-COVID vaccine blood. And, and when blood centers would say, we are not gonna do that, that's something that is not required. Some of these donors then would say that they will not continue donating blood. So I was wondering if, how is the situation in Seattle and if you have encountered something like that. Good question, hard question. So to summarize, um, the um, current state is that um, across the country there are patients who would prefer not to receive blood products from donors who have received the COVID vaccine. And Dr. Pagano is now mentioning that um, there are some donors who would prefer that their products be labeled that they've not been vaccinated. Um, I will tell you until the FDA mandates something, and I don't think they will because there's no scientific evidence to um, support um, uh, let's see, restricting or changing the supply so that we know who's vaccinated and who isn't. It's, it's not something that blood centers are going to, to, um, to do. And, um, you know, the general stance is it's like we, there's other vaccines, you know, flu vaccine that we have rules on too, and they just don't persist in the blood product. And so... Um, it's, it's not a practice that is probably going to be implemented. But difficult. We know that there are people um, going to their legis legislature because they feel so strongly about this issue. They would like to force blood suppliers to um, know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't and to keep segregated inventories. So. Dr. Hassan. Um, so as the use of pathogen reduction increases, has there been talk about cutting down on infectious disease testing? Great question. I meant to... Okay, thank you. So, so Dr. Hassan's question is, 
Pathogen reduction should allow us to stop doing all this testing for HIV and hepatitis and save on cost that way. Well, it turns out the treatment has variable um, rates of inactivation of different pathogens, and so not yet. The FDA is not comfortable yet um, allowing us to stop doing our regular testing on the unit. Other questions? Uh, we all know COVID has affected the cost of everything with the inflation. How is it going to affect the cost of uh, blood supply in um, coming years? So if I understood your question, COVID has, um, effect, has affected the cost of everything, and how will it affect the cost in coming years? Um, well, I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping over time the effect of COVID on the blood supply um, goes down. I think we're left with this bigger problem of we can't sell units for less than um, what they cost to produce. You're just eventually going to go under over time doing that. So I believe over time that's going to become the predominant issue. John, do you have an opinion on COVID long term? Historically, most of the, you know, 70 percent of your blood donors were collected on mobile blood drives. You know, you brought that together. Um, you, you know, but that means you need bigger buildings and you have to heat them and you know, uh, all of that stuff and retrain a whole new staff that you you lost and all of that kind of, that, you know, many of these things are, are more or less going to be, some of them are going to be permanent. Yeah, that, that is a good point. So if we really can't reach out to the Microsofts of, of the world and, and go to them, it's back to this question of how do we get them to come to us? What kind of convenience do you need to create? Um, I guess whether that's bigger, more mobile buses going into neighborhoods to try to recoup some of that, that certainly is an expense um, that we didn't have prior because we could just go and use the space that they provided. So, Okay, thanks very much.